Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Magnify Your Miracles podcast. I'm Reverend Francis Faden, and I'm so excited to be sharing a wonderful guest interview with you today with the authors of one of my favorite books, The Way of the Rose. But before we get started, I got to always do what we always do. We're going to take a few deep breaths together and just get ourselves grounded and centered. And remember, if you're driving, please keep your eyes open, but you can still bring your awareness to your breath. And just give yourself permission to be here in this moment, because we know that the now is where the divine dwells. So whatever happened before, whatever might be happening afterwards, and just preparing ourselves to receive this inspiration today. Already starting to feel the energy of the Divine Mother joining us and supporting us. Knowing that we're gonna be getting exactly what we need today. Let's take one more deep breath in gratitude. And we can begin. All right, well, welcome once again, my miraculous friends, to this episode. I am, I can't, I hope I can contain myself for this particular interview. Um, we have joining us today the authors of one of my favorite books, The Way of the Rose, Clark Strand and Pradita Finn, and I'm going to introduce them to you. They are the co-founders of The Way of the Rose, which is an inclusive fellowship of rosary friends dedicated to the earth and to the lady by any name we wish to call her, and the book The Way of the Rose, which is the radical path of the divine feminine hidden in the rosary. Uh, Clark Strand is the author of numerous books and articles on spiritual practices, including Seeds from a Birch Tree, Writing Haiku and the Spiritual Journey, and Waking Up in the Dark, Waking Up, Waking Up to the Dark, rather, Ancient Wisdom for a Sleepless Age. And Perdita Finn is a children's book author and former high school teacher, and they live with their family up in the Catskill Mountains. And welcome, you guys. Welcome. Welcome. Thank you. Thanks for having us on the show. Oh, thank you so much. I know uh, you have a lot of different things going on right now, and these are very interesting times. So uh, one, of the, <laughs> one of the things I always ask my, um, my guest is, since this is the Magnify Your Miracles podcast, what your definition is of a miracle. How do you guys relate to that word? Hmm. Well, Our Lady has said that a miracle is the most natural mm -hmm. outcome of all, the most natural possible outcome. And uh, she's also talked about the fact that, you know, the earth is ultimately the source of all miracles and that when we connect to our mother and to the earth, you know, we, we become like, you know, plants that, that have their roots in the soil and we can draw from the earth, you know, those blessings that, that are ours. And uh, part of that process is learning to discern, you know, what our miracle is, what it is that we truly need and truly want, our heart's desires. Our Lady has said she has planted she has put a little bit of soil in everyone's heart and a seed that's just waiting to grow. But in a very practical terms, you know, we can engage with the miraculous and we have let go of the realm of the miraculous in modern life. And a lot of what we want to do is begin to create that belief sphere that allows us to recognize and call forth miracles in our lives. Uh, Clark and I were very fascinated when we wrote The Way of the Rose in medieval miracle books. Yeah. Uh, one of the ones we write about is uh, in one year in a remote outpost of the Dordogne called Rocamador, a scribe wrote down the miracles of the Black Madonna there, the Black Madonna of Rocamador, for one year. There are hundreds of miracles. And they're fascinating because what do people what are people praying for well sometimes they're praying because the, me the medicine doesn't work heal me I, there's no more hope the doctors can't fix me sometimes they're praying because they don't have homes and they need homes sometimes they're praying for their children they're praying because they're in prison yeah. they're praying because there's no food they're praying because they can't get the fires to stop or they're they praying for simple things there's one story where a woman loses her starling <laughs> And she prays for it to come back, right? She has a pet starling. And apparently her <laughs> servants were so 
irritated at her whining about the starling <laughs> that they too began to pray to Our Lady for the starling to return. Whereupon the starling came back and the whole team went to Our Lady of Broken Medora to say thank you. I mean, th these stories were like the popular literature also of their day. So some of them were actually quite funny and, and a lot of them are like adventure stories. Uh, but uh, but they're, they're, they give us a real a sort of cross-section of medieval life, and they tell us two things. One is that people were open to the miraculous. They expected yes. the miraculous. And the other is that the, 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 the number one performer of miracles during the Middle Ages is Our Lady. Uh, God and Jesus are very rarely mentioned in the miracle stories. They, they have a completely sort of, you know, uh, they're off stage most of the time. Occasionally, they'll make a cameo appearance, but that's it. Our Lady is the one with feet on the ground and hands working in every possible dimension to make things happen. And, you know, we have a miracle book for the miracles of Our Lady of Woodstock as well that we're adding to. Just today, we do an ongoing novena practice with the Way of the Rose. And in the middle of that practice, it's, it's over the course of two moons. And at the end of the first moon, you're expected to be grateful for your miracle. Have people experienced miracles, I said yeah. today. One woman said, my son just got into detox. Yeah. yeah. A Absolutely. natural miracle. But if you're a mother praying for that miracle, it feels hopeless and impossible. And when it happens, you know how huge it is. Yeah. You know, and, and sometimes we've seen people pray for love. We, we had a woman pray for a child. We, we've seen people pray for homes. Who didn't, yeah. We've had a woman who was homeless, yeah. who was praying to find a home. We had a woman who'd lost her child who prayed to know that her child was still there and the next day received a sign. Wow, wow. And, and these are the miracles, because Our Lady is a generous mother. Yeah. But we have to ask. But we have to ask, I know, that's the thing. It's like, <laughs> you have to ask, absolutely. I, I, I love that. And, and the thing is, once you ask though, you're just, you're in that energy of, of, uh, it's even more than protection. It's like, I don't even know what to call it. It's like Our Lady of Guadalupe says, under, under my mantle, in the, folds of my, in the folds of my shawl. It's like, it's this energy of, of I don't even know what to call it, but it's so You're in the wonderful. Madonna zone. <laughs> yeah, in the Madonna zone, totally. And that's and, kind and of, go ahead. People get scared that when they pray for something, the universe is gonna play gotcha. That's right and make something bad happen, that they're gonna somehow yeah. ask for something that's bad for them. People are very superstitious about prayer, we've found, and at the same time, they doubt prayer. So the same person who will doubt that their prayer will be answered will also be very superstitious in the beginning, and they'll say something like, well, what if I pray for the wrong thing? Like, what if I pray for the thing that's actually going to keep my real heart's desire from manifesting? And her lady doesn't work that way. She meets us where we are. She's a good mama. She's a good mom. Yeah. You she know, once said that when a when a child is learning to walk, the mother doesn't particularly care where he's walking because walking, learning to walk is the point. Nevertheless, she will keep him from stepping off a ledge. Right. Right. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. So we're learning to walk when we begin praying for our heart's desire. We we don't have to know where we're going really in the beginning. The whole point is to, is to connect with, with, with our hearts and connect with Our Lady. I love that. You know, I did, I did your novena the last, for the first time I actually did the 54 days starting, mm -hmm. and I think it was February. Um, and I had the same thing of like, what, what is my heart's desire? And I just said, you know what, you know what it is. I'm just gonna keep praying and just trusting it. And things were revealed to me that I never would have asked for that I think I thought were not possible. Mm -hmm. And in such a sweet way, she brought things into my experience that were just miraculous. They just are, absolutely. Wow. I, the things I have seen have been astounding. I wow. mean, you know, I mean, I saw a woman in a bad marriage finally find the courage to pray for divorce. Yes. And I saw her pray through getting a lawyer. I saw her pray through claiming her self-esteem through healing her relationships with her children and then i saw her pray for love and, and she got i mean yeah. and to watch i mean this was a six-year process of prayer yeah i mean i think sometimes when we talk about miracles 
we think that it's going to be like a vending machine. Yeah. Right. We're going to put in, <laughs> we're going to put in our quarter of prayer, and the candy bar is going to come out. Right. And in fact, what's going to happen is we're going to turn around, walk down the hallway, and walk out into the door into a new world. Yes. And yes. it's going to unfold in front of us. Absolutely. Absolutely. So for and people, I, go ahead. No, I was just going to say that Our Lady once said that she doesn't deal in SOSs. And when we first heard that, we were sort of, we were sort of terrified because we thought, well, gosh, a lot of our prayers are SOSs, <laughs> right? They feel like sometimes just yeah. distress calls. And she said, no, by SOS, I mean single outcome scenarios. Oh, I love that. I, said, I, Ooh, don't I gotta write deal, that down. I don't I deal in single outcome scenarios. She said, there's always another way. She says, when you decide like exactly how your prayer is going to be answered, yes. it takes me longer to answer it oh, because I goodness. have a lot of different paths toward, to, towards answering your prayer. And all you have to do is, is state your prayer, form your intention, and then just put one foot in front of the other. She says, I will lead you yeah. to the answer to your prayer. But it may not, the pathway may not be as straight as you think it is. It may right. take you on a journey. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. So just so that everybody who hasn't read the book, we can catch people up. Um, I want you guys to share, because, you know, Clark, you're, you had a Buddhist background, and I know you're very much a feminist. And, like, how would you guys find your way to the rosary? Like, just, just share with people. <laughs> Uh, just well, share with people so they have an idea of what we're talking about. It's taken three books to explain this. I know. This. I know. Clark I know. wrote one book, Waking Up to the Dark. Then we wrote Way of the Rose together. And I'm finishing up my book, which is called Take Back the Magic. But so we'll try to give you the summary yes, version. Yes, please. Clark left we, Buddhism. Neither of us was raised Catholic. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I was raised by Bohemian atheists. Clark was raised by Southern Presbyterian Episcopalians. Yeah. Okay. We both, through a series of journeys, not dissimilar to many people's, ended up in Buddhism, right. which we both, when we became young parents, were quite dissatisfied by. And um, also Clark had been the editor of a Buddhist magazine and was right. documenting both the sexual and financial scandals yeah. in Buddhism. And we were sort of right. seeing it up close. Um, and I found myself as a young mother looking for a spiritual home. Mm -hmm. unable to find one and because wherever i went whatever whether it was a christian community or a buddhist community i ended up in the back room with everybody's kids right. and <laughs> somehow always what happened to me and i was sort of like this is kind of the game in town but i, I feel taught, very marginalized she's taught every every imaginable form of sunday school zen sunday school <laughs> episcopal sunday school the list goes on i'm not even on. christian and they put me in charge of sunday school <laughs> and but but what i but so eventually uh one day we're taking our little daughter to the episcopal church and she said Oh, I hate Jesus. And that was it. We turned the car around and we came home. <laughs> I said, that's it. This is not the point. <laughs> and for reasons it's taken three books to explain, I started praying the rosary, yeah. which is the prayer of my ancestral grandmothers. I'm, you know, Irish, English, French, Polish. Right, right. And I, I was embarrassed that I was praying mm. at Francis, but I loved it. Mm. I taught myself the Hail Marys and the Our Fathers. I, the children would fall asleep with me at night and they would be playing with my hair, holding it. And mm. I'd be holding my rosary. And I took as my Zen koan, you know, that Zen riddle that's supposed to untie the knots in your soul. Yeah. Mother of God. What does that mean, Mother of God? What, ha what happens when we take the biggest concept in the universe and give it a mama? And that became a very private practice. And I thought, I'm never going to meet any non-Christian ex-Buddhists who want to pray the rosary with me. <laughs> <laughs> Not even my husband wants to do it with me. <laughs> and so here I am in this very private experience. And then on June 11th, 2016, June 16th, 2011, everything changed. Yeah. So I, you know, I actually taught Perdita how to pray the rosary because I had just learned it on a whim after right. 
trip to the Taos, New Mexico, where I ran into statues of Our Lady of Guadalupe everywhere I went. So I learned it, but I quickly discarded it because, you know, it, it was just like everything else I was doing in those days. When I stopped being a, a Zen Buddhist monk and, you know, I, I became sort of spiritually promiscuous. Like I just tried everything. I was yeah. studying, you just said, I would study with rabbis and, you know, and uh, imams and, you know, just you name it. And, um, so I learned the rosary. I taught it to her. She kept praying and I quit it after like two or three weeks. She kept for years, like 12 years. <laughs> and, uh, but then, uh, you know, 12 years after I first learned it, um, I, you know, I'm in the habit of getting up in the middle of the night to go out for a walk. And I was getting up for my usual walk. This is a subject of uh, the first book of the way of the rose trilogy, which is waking up to the dark. Yeah. And I had my hand on the doorknob and I was about to go out when a voice said, don't go out tonight, stay inside and be very, very still, which I did. And I, you know, I've been as in monk, so I knew how to meditate. So I got into that sort of meditative place. And after 40 minutes, I felt her presence. I opened my eyes and there was a girl of around 17 years old with uh, close cropped auburn hair, uh, hazel eyes, uh, uh, sort of a roundish moon-like face with freckles around her nose and an X of black electrical tape over her mouth. Mm. and uh, her eyes were very, very urgent and very pleading, and I'd been taught as a Zen monk, and I, in fact, as a Zen teacher, I had taught people this as well, that these kinds of experiences are called makio or illusion, so right. you just stare them down, so I was just ready to stare her down, and I stared at her for all of about five seconds and thought, you win. <laughs> <laughs> no contest. <laughs> In this scenario, you are far realer than I am. <laughs> so I, you know, uh, you know, I give up. So I reached out and I, I pulled the tape off her mouth and I could actually feel the resistance of her skin against, against wow. the tape as I pulled it. And she gasps. There's a sound yeah. like, described it in, in Waking Up to the Dark as a sound like air rushing into a crypt that had been sealed for thousands of years. Wow. It, was, it was a sound that was much too big for the size of her body. And then I started to ask the obvious question, which is, you know, who are you? And, uh, but she just shook her head and like nothing could be said. So, you know, I always joke, you know, and then what happened? Well, what happened is the Zen monk part of my brain went out again and I just shut my eyes. And in fact, 40 minutes later, when I opened them up, she was gone. So, mm -hmm. but I woke up the next morning, I turned the whole house upside down looking for the tape. Could yeah. not find it anywhere yeah. and she she has been uh at my side you know for nine years now ever since she's never absent i don't always see her but yeah. she's always her presence is always there so i knew you know i woke up the next morning feeling that presence and knowing that you know my life had, had completely and utterly changed 10 weeks later she woke me in the middle of the night and said uh if you rise to pray the rosary tonight a column of saints will support your prayer and that's when I finally admitted to myself what I had suspected all along, which is that, well, who else can this be? She's asked me to pray the rosary. Right. So at that point, I really knew, even though she didn't look like the Virgin Mary, that was who I was talking to. Yeah. And that, that's, I love that story. I mean, oh my God, it's just, I get chills every time I read it or hearing you guys. It's amazing. And one of the things that I love with your work is that you refer to her as Our Lady. I call, for me, the God the energy is divine mother that's what i say mm. but she she manifested for me specifically as mother mary and i grew up catholic so even though i'm an interfaith minister and i don't relate to all the catholic stuff um but that's what i say but i always tell people if i was in china she might be Kuan yin if i was in india you know it might show up differently um yeah. and so for people to understand that um for you guys like this this whole thing it predates christianity really who is our lady and i know that that's a big part of your, your message about why she came to you specifically. And, well, you know, we got, now. needless to say, um, fascinated by apparitional experiences and began reading about them for the first time in our lives. And two things became clear. The places she showed up were very, very old. And, you know, we talked about Lady of Rocamadour in the beginning. There is a cave next door to Our Lady of Rocamador with cave art from 30,000 years ago. Yeah. And there is evidence that hominids have been coming to those caves for 300,000 years. Yeah. 
You go to Lourdes and the grotto at Lourdes is a site of human habitation for a hundred thousand years. Wow. So, so the lady who's appearing, we may call her Mary today, but there, she's had many other names. And mm. for the medieval people, one of the things I found fascinating was they were barely Christian. They were illiterate. They lived in small remote villages. Mm -hmm. They'd been living in these villages for thousands of years. If yeah. you do DNA testing, I think there's one village in England where the people have DNA tests 8,000 years back. They, they wow. People. They didn't read and write. They didn't read the Bible. The priests didn't read and write. So their real scripture was nature. Their real tradition was the stories passed down in their families. Mm -hmm. Those were stories of a mother goddess who you brought roses to in the springtime, who you crowned with flowers, mm -hmm. who you knew fed you, you knew loved you, you knew her body was where you came from and where you would return mm. to. And you might call that Mother Isis, you might call her Diana, you might call her Bridget, you might call her Mary, but she was Mama. Mm. And you know, the rosary, even the name of the rosary harkens back to that. Roses were uh, sacred to in Nana and Isis and Venus and Aphrodite and countless other mother goddesses throughout the Central Europe and the Middle East for thousands of years before they became sacred to Mary. And a lot of the iconography and even the legends associated with Mary are actually much, much older than Christianity. They go back way far into the past. And so uh, when people began to, uh, you know, adopt the Virgin Mary as the newest version of this ancient mother goddess that their people have been worshiping for thousands of years, it was a very natural thing for them to associate any practices or prayers with her with roses. And so the rosary really originates in, you know, two practices coming together. One was a kind of a monastic type practice where people would say, Ave Maria, gratia plena, Dominus tecum, right? Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. And they would bow before a statue of the Virgin Mary. Mm. And then there was this other tradition whereby people in villages would weave crowns of wild roses every spring and all summer long, as long as they were available, and place them on the heads of the, of the statues of the Virgin Mary in their local churches. They were crowning her as the, as the mother goddess who renews the land in spring. These two traditions came together, and starting around a thousand years ago, you begin to hear the same legend told over and over again about a young boy who who loves to weave these crowns for the Virgin. He loves them so much, he thinks, I'll just become a monk. So he goes to the monastery, and he's given all these duties to perform, and the priests say, no, that's a pagan ritual. You can't offer the crown anymore. So he says, forget that. I'm leaving. And as he's leaving, the Virgin Mary appears to him and says, no, 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 don't worry. The world's changed. Uh, we'll improvise here. I'll teach you a new way. You can say Ave Maria's to me, and in that way, you're weaving a spiritual crown of flowers for me. So you can stay here if you like, and you can weave your crown for me by saying Ave Marias. So in every legend, the boy starts to say the prayers, and actual roses come out of his mouth. Oh, wow. Isn't that oh, a wonderful wow. story? That's, that's so wonderful the rosary story. is born from the sort of collision of those two traditions, one Christian and one pagan. So they become a, you know, kind of a hybrid or an amalgam. But the result is that the mother goddess gets smuggled into Christianity. <laughs> <laughs> right, under, right under the priest's noses. <laughs> I love that. Well, I have to say, so we're recording this, even though it'll be released later, we're recording this on the feast day of Our Lady of Fatima. And you guys probably know another name for Our Lady of Fatima is Our Lady of the Rosary. So yes. I don't think it's any coincidence that we're talking about uh, the rosary and the power of that. Can you guys explain to people who may not have been raised with any, might, might not even be Christian, because um, Mother Mary, whenever she appears, she's always encouraging us to pray and specifically pray, pray the rosary. But how, how can you do it if you're not from that tradition in your experience? Well, here's, I think there are two answers to that. One is Our Lady has, since she started showing up, she started showing up a lot after 1830, and we write about this in the book. Yeah. And she has a tendency to show up just before things go a little south. Yep. Whether it's the 1918 flu, yep. whether it's with Fatima, she shows up right before the flu strikes. Yep. Um, whether she shows up in Rwanda, in Cabejo, just before the genocide. She yep. shows up in Bosnia, just before the massacre at Medjugorje. 
she has a tendency even, and you know, we write a lot in our book about Guadalupe, she shows up in the midst of the worst genocide on our planet, which was the destruction of the Americas by the European invasion. Yeah. And she shows up and she always says the same thing, hold my hand. Mm. She doesn't say, she says, I can get you through this yeah. if you hold my hand. Yeah. And the best way to hold my hand is the rosary. Yeah. And one of the things that's really interesting to me, Francis, is that people have been making rosaries for as long as we've been human. Yeah. Beads are one of the oldest items we find in the archaeological record. 70,000 years ago, there was a volcanic eruption called Mount Toba, and it plunged the whole planet into a climate emergency. And uh, most of human beings on this planet were obliterated. Wow. Most. Yeah. It, was, it was a scale of destruction beyond our imagining. And what did people do? They started making beads. Yeah. Mm. Wow. Beads, and beads are very interesting because they take a lot of time to make. Yeah, they don't have any practical value, like, you know. Why make a bead? Why, when you're in the midst of something very, very frightening, would you want to make a bead? And what we often ask people to do when we were in person is we'll actually hand out beads and give everybody a bead to hold. And say, start rolling it between your fingers. And I'd invite your viewers to imagine rolling a bead between your fingers and see how it begins to make you feel internally. Mm. many people will say it starts to calm them down. Right. Yeah. And one of the reasons for that is if you look at a bead, imagine the bead with the hole for a string to go through it. It is a nipple. Mm. And our first gesture as human beings for comfort is to reach for our mother's nipple. And that's where our food comes from our comfort, our sense of protection, protection, our sense of connection and consolation. And so our gesture as, as apes is to hold onto that nipple mm. to be fed and held. It, and so we as a species began mm. making beads. Mm. And Our Lady says, hold on to me. There's one of my favorite uh, uh, Maria Lactan's paintings uh, uh, comes from uh, uh, the South American tradition. Uh, I, you know, Mary in iconography, and uh, Maria Lactans means the nursing Mary. This was the, one of the most popular representations of Mary throughout the Middle Ages, and even in, even in the Americas beginning in the 16th century. And it shows the Mary, like, like Isis, nursing Horus, nursing the baby Jesus. Yeah. Sometimes she's nursing the, uh, the church fathers. She doesn't put the nipple directly <laughs> in her mouth. She's respectful and she squirts it. You know? She expresses the milk sometimes from 10 or 15 feet away into the mouths of the church fathers, right? Sometimes wow. she, she shoots it directly into their third eye. There's a famous painting of Bernard of Cla Clairvaux offering Ave Marias to, this, uh, to the Black Virgin and uh, her expressing a stream of milk directly into his third eye. But my favorite of all the Maria Lactans paintings shows uh, Mary, you know, with milk dripping from, from her breast and Jesus there holding a rosary. But if you trace the beads of the rosary to see where they're coming from, they're coming from her nipple. So that the rosary is actually, you know, the first two or three beads are white and then they become red and then they connect with the rosary that the, that the, that the child is holding. And so there's this connection between the beads of the rosary and this feeling of comfort and consolation and contact, physical contact with, with the lady. And, you know, we're entering, we know, people always say, what was the third secret of Fatima, right on the day, you know what I mean? <laughs> the mysterious third secret. Right. And we know, we don't know exactly what the third secret is, and yet we know it. Yeah. We're on a collision course on this planet as a species. Yeah. And... You, you know, the scientists are telling us what the third secret yeah. is. And it's not so secret. It's that we can't continue the way we've been going. And Our Lady is saying that to us as yeah. well. Yeah. What she offers us is the guidance to hold us and get us through yeah. the changes we know are coming. Yeah. Our she Lady will be said, with us. Our, Our Lady says over and over again, she's, she said it to Juan Diego, uh, you know, as Our Lady of Guadalupe. She said it to the visionaries at Metagoria and at Cabejo and 
Catherine Lavare and everybody, she always comes with the same basic message is that hard times are coming, really, really difficult times. There will be widespread uh, disruption, there will be wars, there will be pandemics, there will be all these things. And um, you, you are, if you want a path through those, if you want to be able to negotiate your path through those difficulties, hold my hand. And what she means by that is the rosary. I mean, she, she's always saying this and giving people the rosary and saying, here, pray this, hold this in your hand. This is like an umbilical attachment, right? This is like mm. holding the lady's hand. And one of the things that's interesting, you know, at Medjugorje, on that day that there was, you know, she invited Clark, she appeared and invited him to pray the rosary, saying, if, you know, if you rise to say the rosary tonight, a column of saints will support your prayers. And after 12 years, I experienced my miracle because my husband woke up and said, I think I'm going to start praying the rosary. <laughs> <laughs> really? I might add that I now have thousands of friends around the world to pray the rosary with. And for 12 years, I felt that prayer. I said, it's impossible miraculously, wherever I go, there are people who want to pray the rosary with Got me about now. a thousand of them are lapsed Catholic ex-Buddhists. <laughs> yeah, <I know>. so, <laughs> just like you. <laughs> so, so a lot of prayers got answered oh. that day, but we went into this funky little bookstore. We were on vacation, and it was mostly spy thrillers, you know, and yeah. romance novels. Used the beach crowd. Yeah. But there, sitting out on the main table, is a book, Queen of the Cosmos, Messages from the Visionaries of Medjugorje. Mm. Clark opens it up and it says so a page at random and it says the the interviewer says uh, uh, is the rosary recommended for everybody on earth since it's such a distinctively Catholic devotion and uh, the visionary says yes our lady has said has invited everyone on earth to pray the rosary regardless of their religious belief or background right, right. But, it was, but I think the problem with Medjugorje is it happened in a very Catholic context. Right. So it was, and, I, you know, I, what I keep thinking is, oh, she appeared to us because we are outside of the church. Yeah. And it feels like it's our job to bring the rosary to people. But we're already outside the church. So it's e easy for us to say, yeah, yes, you can pray the rosary as a non-Catholic because neither of us are Catholic. And I wasn't raised Catholic. She wasn't either. But, so. but if you're of European heritage or ancestry. Yeah all of your ancestors prayed the rosary and it unless was you're jewish unless you're jewish yeah, yes yeah um and it would it would be their it would be your indigenous heritage yeah and it would it would take you back to the people in those villages who'd been their devotion to the great mother and with all the intermarrying honestly you know most people i think have an ancestral heritage if they go back far enough some sort of ancestral heritage that connects, if not to the rosary, then to the great mother in some other way. And you find it in Judaism too, Asherah was God's wife. Yes, yes. You know, somebody asked me, you know, Reese, we have a lot of Jewish people praying the rosary in our group. And one of them uh, said, you know, I really want my mother to pray the rosary, but I don't know what to say to her because she's Jewish and all that. And I said, well, what's the problem with, uh, with uh, your Jewish mother praying a devotion that's dedicated to another jewish mother exactly <laughs> exactly but that's whenever people say why why would mother mary like why would she come to me i'm not catholic she always says neither am i <laughs> goes, neither am i i love it yeah um, i, I wanted to share something um with you guys that and also with with the listeners um, about your book. Your book is so helpful because i think it answers so many of the questions that we're asking today about the rosary about the Divine Mother, about the whole process, how to make it your own. One of the things that I do that I love to do with this book, once I read it, and you need a box of tissues when you read it, because it's just gonna open your heart incredibly, um, is I now use it like an oracle. I'll just open it up and get a message for the day. And so right before our interview, I said, all right, Divine Mother, what, what, do, what do you want us to know? What do you want me to share with people? And I opened it up to page um, 189, which is this Valley of Tears, and I opened it right to this message, which speaks to exactly what you're saying. There is one delusion at the bottom of human experience today, the belief that you live in a motherless, comfortless world. This is the source of all other delusions and the cause of all unhappiness. And that's exactly what we're talking about right now. And with everything that's going on in the world, what do you guys really want to share with people about 
about what's happening, about, about the rosary? What do you want them to know? What can they take away? Well, I think one of the things is we've been in charge. We've, we've imagined we were in charge for a long time. Right. And how's that working for us? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and, you know, there is, uh, there's an old adage from AA that says our best thinking got us here. And that means in the room of an a of a twelve step program, you know, and it's and that delusional thinking of the addict, you know, that you know, just a I, just a little finessing, and I'll get my addiction just right. And that's the way as modern people we are in relationship to our culture and to our technology. Yeah. Our Lady has come right now and showed us what we need to do. Mm. She is even now showing us that our way of life has to change. And in fact, but she's there and I know she's there and I, I want to know she's there. You know, we had, our daughter had to go into the hospital the other day by herself to the emergency room. And it's very frightening to send your child. I mean, and I know there are a lot of people sending loved ones into the hospital by themselves right now. Right. And I had that moment where I said, oh, she's not alone. Hmm. No one dies alone. Mm. No one's born alone. No one dies alone. The mother is with them. Mm. And the mother is with every person right now. Mm. One of her messages outside of the church has been, there's not just one life to work with. There are a lot of lives. There's a lot of coming and going. And she said, what you experience is death. I experience is moving you from one hip to another. Oh, I love and that. Back and forth and back and forth. You know how you, when you're a mother, you've ever had a toddler on your hip, one hip gets tired, you move it over to the other, and they get tired, you move it over to the other. She said, that's just it. It's just back and forth in my arms. Birth to death, the birth to death. And mm -hmm. we pray the rosary, which has mysteries of birth, death, and rebirth, to teach ourselves the long story of our souls. Mm -hmm. We have lived now inside the short story of our souls. And mm -hmm. that, Clark sometimes says, you know, the Bible is a thought experiment that shows us what it's like to live in the straight line of a single story. Mm -hmm. And where does it end? Apocalypse. Yeah. But the rosary doesn't end with apocalypse. The folk people who developed the rosary refused and rejected the idea that they should end the rosary with the last judgment. Yeah. They ended it with Our Lady crowned queen of heaven and earth. Mm -hmm. That's what heals us. That's what saves us. Right. If we let her be in charge of her own body, mm -hmm. if we let her make the choices about what she wants to do and what's yeah. good for her own body, we'll be protected. Mm -hmm. You know, Francis, you, you mentioned the current you know, pandemic and, you know, all the disruptions and everything. Our Lady has, uh, as Perdita mentioned, she tends to appear uh, anywhere from, you know, three or four to 12 years prior to an event like this. Right. And Our Lady has, has suggested to us that this is the first of many, many events. Uh, and that she hasn't come this time just to guide us through one event, but through a series of cascading events okay. over the next few decades. And uh, so this often happens. And uh, very early on, she will typically communicate that this is the case. Uh, Perdita mentioned her waking me up one night, and you know, I guess 10 weeks after the initial apparition and said, if you rise to say the rosary tonight, a call on the saints will support your prayer. I started saying the rosary. I would wake up every night and do that when we were on vacation on Cape Cod. The night before we left, uh, that year, this was the uh, summer of 2011, just shortly after the apparitions. She woke me and she said, um, it is all right to destroy the things you seem to love, but secretly hate. In mm. fact, it may be necessary to do so. And I was very chilled by this. And, and she said it very sweetly and very softly, but the words were chasing. I couldn't imagine what those things were. The very next morning we woke up and the first thing we heard on the news was that there was an enormous hurricane headed right for us. So we got off of, you know, we, we got off of Cape Cod as fast as we could and we got home to Woodstock. Well, it, it jumped its groove and didn't strike Cape Cod, it struck Woodstock <laughs> and knocked the power out for two weeks running. There were local yeah. people who died in, in the storm. People lost their houses. It was just a a huge collapse. 
locally. But that was sort of, I think, for me, the wake up call. I was thinking, oh, right, like the town to the north of us has had five hundred year floods in the past 20 years, right? Five. And, you know, we, we had, Pradeet and I were very educated about climate change and, you know, we, we study ecology. My brother is an evolutionary uh, a geneticist who studies uh, uh, species populations and he's been predicting mass extinction for a long time. So, you know, we were, these ideas were not new to us. So when we hear about the 10 secrets of uh, the visionaries at Metagoria that are later to be built to them, you know, our first thought was, well, I wonder if they're the same secrets as our environmental journalist friends have been telling us about. Wildfires you can't stop, depleting aquifers, you know, uh, right. uh, you know, antibiotic resistant bacteria, the list goes on and on. We've, we have painted ourselves into a corner as a species and, you know, we have to wake up to, to the fact that we live uh, in collaboration with a lot of other beings on this planet and share the planet with them. You know, when Our Lady of Guadalupe appears to Juan Diego, you know, that is an incredible moment. And, and the, the image of our, the Virgin of Guadalupe is so familiar to people. Here she is, this young woman, she's pregnant. She appears pregnant to him and it's a sign. She says, you're in the midst. Juan Diego would have been 18 when Columbus landed in Hispaniola. He has seen for his whole life violence we can't even imagine. I mean, right. he's seen his people slaughtered, tortured, their temples raised. He's seen people and he loved raped and pa murdered. And pandemics that are so so much that aren't even on a scale with what's happening now. They're so far beyond our ninety percent of the people being dying. And yeah. And 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 our lady appears to him and says, Am I not here who am your mother? And it's this incredible moment. She appears both as Tonansen, the mother goddess of the Aztecs, mm -hmm. and Mary, the mother goddess, which is what she's always doing. Yeah, right. Try, just try to keep me out. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I don't care what you call me. <laughs> I'm mama and I'm here and I've got you. And she also appears, you know, there's a beautiful writer who said, you know, there were so many young women who'd been raped by the Spanish soldiers. And here they are, this just horrified to be carrying the children of their oppressors. And yet there's their mother also pregnant, also saying to them, you're gonna survive. Your people will survive. Yeah. We'll get through this together somehow. And it doesn't mean life is gonna be rosy and easy but it means that you we're going to get through this our souls are going to get through this with her and we're all going to learn how to be with her and at the end of one of the last messages in the book the book is filled with her messages she gives a formal message on the 16th of every month still today oh, i didn't know that wow and she we post these on the facebook group and on the website um all of her messages are available for everyone on the website to read um but uh she said i would like everybody to become a mother men and women young and old the living in the dead the living in the dead yeah. join me and being a mother in the world she says we are all one mother of the world we are all one mother of the world that and, that is her core message and it's an invitation to us in these moments. And we're seeing how wonderful it is. I mean, when we see the courage of so many people today, the courage of our healthcare workers, the courage of, the courage of our postmen, the courage of you know, the people who show up to work in the pharmacies and the grocery stores, they are behaving. They're filled with that cur courageous heart, the heart power of the lady. That's what it really means. Mm -hmm. And she invites us into that courage. I love that. You know, I, I also um, study a lot with the apparitions and the messages and all of that. And I was really struck by one of the messages that you shared on your Facebook group. I think you said you'd gotten it in September, but she asked you to wait until April. Um, and you know, like, you know, Medjugorje and all that, you read them and you're like, okay, kind of sounds apocalyptic. Like there's really no, you don't have like any context for it. But right. when you shared that post about, and the streets will be empty, and like, I was just like, 
whoa, wow. Now it's like hitting home and it's really- It was all about the lungs of the world. Yeah, it was all about the lungs of the world and clearing the lungs of the world and and all of that. But it was about, it begins with an image of empty streets. You'll look out and the only wind will fill the streets. They'll be empty and you won't understand what you're seeing. And yeah. So let me unpack it for you and explain what you're really looking at. And then she, she elaborates on that. People can uh, go to the uh, website, wayofthe-rose.org, uh, and uh, read that message. But she gave that message, I believe, on uh, September 27th of last year. And uh, she said, uh, Perdina says, is this a message? She says, yes, but save it. I'll tell you when to share it. Yeah. To be held in reserve. And we forgot about we it. We forgot about it. Yeah, of course. And then she said, and then she said, and then a few weeks ago, she said, there's a message that I told you to hold in reserve. It's it, back in the notebooks from last <laughs> fall. You'll find it. <laughs> she said, I told you to label this hold in reserve. And so we went back through the, took us like an hour to look back through all the messages. <laughs> Finally found it. We read it. And we went, oh my God. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. But so, we hadn't known what we were listening to. We didn't know at the time. Started. We had no idea what she was talking about. But it, it, you know, it, it, yeah. Um, who who can? I mean, that's yeah. that's the whole point, right? And also, you know, I sometimes think with the apparitions. I mean, I've you know, I wrote a book with a psychic, and I've seen a lot of these things. You know, water filters through the stone and takes on the flavor of the stone. So you know what I mean? It you know, it's always going to come through the culture of the person who's right, sharing exactly. messages exactly. and the vocabulary and the language. And you know, I even know like there's the apparitions down in um, Georgia where yeah. are right. And she's saying, oh, there's going to be an invasion from China that's going to disrupt America. Well, you know, she was envisioning armies, right. armies you know, right. <laughs> not, a virus. not microbes. <laughs> right. right, exactly. And so yeah. there's, you know, we don't really know what we're hearing a lot of times. And I think one of the things that our ladies about is we can't really understand. Yeah. She says, if you could tell the future, you wouldn't be in this mess. She said this to, to us a number of <laughs> yeah. times. So, yeah. so don't, you know, waste your time trying to, to tell the future, predict the future. Your job is to, is to take one step after another and to trust me at every step of the way. And if you, she says, if you do that, I can guide you through the challenges that you are about to face. Yeah. So powerful. I love that. Oh, and it's so, so reassuring for these times. So reassuring. Well, before we wrap up, I promised myself that I would ask you a question that I really wanted to know, which I want to know about these medieval rosaries and the chakras. I want to know about all the different oh. ones. <laughs> you left us, we could do a whole episode on that. I know, and maybe we will, maybe we should, but it, do you have a resource for me or a book or I'll something start. I could do to like find, because yeah, I'm just like, to, ooh. We need to, well, I've, I've got a, I've, I've got a book. On, on uh, here's that. the thing. <laughs> Tell me. There are a lot. There was no. The idea. The rosary was a folk practice. Right. And it wasn't systematized. Right. Yeah. The church, increasingly after the Reformation and during the Counter Reformation, wanted to take the rosary away from the peasants. Right. They wanted to control it. They put the creed on it. Later, they would add the luminous mysteries. It was there was always an attempt to take it away from women, yeah. because right. it was seen as it was revolutionary, right? Radical. Um, there were a lot of rosaries in the Middle Ages. Oh. Clark and I love. We are fanatics about weird rosary, <laughs> and there's a Saint Anne rosary. There's a Saint oh, Anne. Yeah. I pray that one. It's great. There's a Saint Anthony rosary. There's a rosary that's dedicated to the seven sorrows of Our Lady. Mm. Yeah, um, yeah. And there's, there's the a rosary. rosary. There is, and there's the rosary of the seven joys, which I think is the one you're talking yes, about. Yes, it is. This the is, the Fran- is that the Franciscan one? That's the oh, okay. Franciscan crown. And, okay. And it, interestingly, before Vatican, the reforms of Vatican II in 1962. Yeah. Uh, the 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 Franciscan crown was the most, quote, heavily indulgenced Catholic devotion in the entire church. Like this particular rosary had big juju, right? Like (laughs) tremendous energy. Like if you wanted to liberate souls in purgatory, if you want, this was your main, this was your main thing, right? And then suddenly the church decided, no, this thing is way too powerful. We've given this thing much too much 
cred. This is, for one thing, it's an entirely Marian devotion. It's about the seven joys of Our Lady. There's no Jesus in it to speak of, right? Right, right. So, you know, they decided it was much too focused on Mary, and Vatican II is trying to de-emphasize Mary, and so it told the Franciscans to take it off of their habit, and it stripped it of all wow. of its indulgence overnight. Wow. So it just vanishes. But if you, if you go back and you look at the lore, you, what you find is that there must have been some kind of contact between the Franciscan missionaries and Buddhists because, or Hindus because the seven joys match up precisely with the seven chakras. Including the you, colors you're visualizing. Yeah. The visualizations are all for each. There's a visualization for each chakra. Which are the colors color of the rain. Yeah. Ah. And so you, the build seven, a, you build the seven joys of Mary up within you. Yeah. And the seven joys are, are associated with the seven uh, colors of the rainbow. And if you go back and look at paintings of St. Francis, right? Yeah. Like yeah. You see the, his stigmata from the angel, uh, from the seraph in the sky. If you go back and look at paintings that were painted like within it, you know, uh, maybe uh, 50 or 60 years after he died. If you look at the angels, they're rainbow angels. Wow. Yeah, their wings are rainbow colored. Wow. Like the rainbows behind you. Like the chakras. Yes, yes. I work with chakras with people all the time. That's why I was like, I got to know about the chakras. I got to know that one. So That's wrote, so awesome. The piece on this. We, are, are, we would love to write a book of nothing but wonky rosary lore. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, we want to get people praying it enough that they want yeah. to have the extras. I mean, because you can also do, you can do the seven sorrows going down yeah. and then do the seven joys going up. Yeah, and medieval people clearly did this. There was one rosary that Perdita alluded to, the Brigitte rosary, sometimes called the interestingly enough, the corona of Our Lady. Ah, that's right, right. Yeah, so this rosary, you prayed, uh, you prayed the seven sorrows and the seven joys on it. So one day you'd be praying the seven, you'd be praying the seven joys going up the seven chakras. The next day you'd be praying the, the seven sorrows going down. Yeah. Some people pray the seven joys going up in the morning and then in the evening they pray the seven joys going back seven down. Sorrows going seven down. Seven sorrows going back down. Wow. Yeah. I love that. So I really hope that you guys write that book. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. <laughs> it's so awesome. Okay. So I'm going to put all this great information on the, um, on the show notes, but just to let people know to get in touch with you or to find out more. First of all, obviously get the book, The Way of the Rose, which is wonderful. It's available on Amazon. You can also get the, um, the audible version of it and listen to it if you like, which is also really, really moving. And then there is your website, wayoftherose.org. Is that right? Yes, yes, it is. And then I highly recommend people get on Facebook and join the Way of the Rose uh, Facebook group. I, I'll just share this really, really quickly that I found you guys. It was very miraculous because, you know, I was like, Mother Mary, what do you mean do this rosary thing? I know she wanted it, but I was like, I don't really vibe with this whole thing. And <laughs> one day I said, all right, if you want me to do this, then teach me about the power of it because I don't get it. And the next day, one of your posts showed up in my feed and I was like, what is this? <laughs> what is this, this is strange miracle. land? What is this strange land where people talk about the goddess and they're talking about Mother Mary and they're talking about like, what is it? And I love it because on that Facebook group, people can, you can show up as you are and wherever you are, you're welcome. So I'm going to post this, that in the show notes. This as well. group and a lot of people we know are on Facebook only for this group. Yeah, so you can just come right. and it's a very kind and gentle site. Um, I must say it's very friendly. We allow no commerce on the site, no fundraising money and right. selling of anything. It's just no advertising. It's just friendship. Yeah. But we have people coming from all over the world. We have people coming who are lapsed Catholics. We have people who are Hindus from India yes. who are devoted to the lady. We have people, you know, coming from all kinds of backgrounds. Yeah. And our motto is is that, you know, we, we basically uh, uh, we're concerned with the rosary, the lady, by whatever name you wish to call her, right? right, right. And the earth. And the earth. And the earth. earth, the lady, the rosary. Yeah. So it's a lot of fun, and, and, we, and, we, and we, are, it, we all get to know the lady through each other. Yeah. That's mostly. Yeah. I know, and, and to just read people's miracles and their manifestations, and just like, oh, it's just amazing. It's just an amazing journey.
Mm-hmm. Well, thank you guys so much. Maybe we will do part two one day. That would be fun. <laughs> that would be fun. <laughs> all the different kinds of rosies. That would be great. So thank you so much for being thank with you. me. Thank I so you appreciate so much. it. And I just want to say to everybody, remember, the way to magnify your miracles is to always know that your miracle is already here. God bless you. and Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Thanks so much.